want to start the service today by acknowledging our fathers, not just the biological fathers. Any fool with working equipment can be a biological father, but it takes someone special to be a dad. And I want to acknowledge those fathers that have stepped up and become dad. Some of you may not even have children of your own, but you've stepped into the gap and spoken into the lives of young people. Some of you are setting examples, godly spiritual examples for your children. And I want to bless you this morning. I was reading an article. Uh, the article was written by a gentleman named Marshall Siegel. He is a writer for DesiringGod.org. Uh, in his article, The League of Extraordinary Gentle Men. What do, or where do good dads come from? He made this statement, and I thought this is right spot on. He says, every good dad is a miracle worked by God in some uniquely impossible circumstances. No man has the giftedness, strength, and resolve to love a woman and their children in a way that joyfully sacrifices for their needs and consistently leads them to Christ. Every good father, then, is extraordinary. And I don't think we give enough credit to fathers in this country. Back in the 60s, we started a, a cultural revolution. We were changing the dynamic of the way that society perceived men. And I think in some ways that was a very necessary shift. But I think in other ways, it was incredibly detrimental. We have stripped manhood away from fathers. We have told them to get in touch with their feminine side. Folks, God made them male and female. He created man to be a man and woman to be a woman, that they might complement each other and fill the gaps in each other, that before God the two would be one. I want to say thank you to the men in this church, not just for, for being fathers, but for being dads. Proverbs 20, verse 7. I'm going to read it to you out of the ESV first, and then I'm going to read it to you out of the NAS, NASB. Uh, in the ESV it reads, The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. In the NASB they insert a word that I think is more accurate. It says, A righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed are his children after him. Now fathers, I, you guys have gotten a pretty rough shake. I quit going to church on Father's Day shortly after we started having children. Because it seems like that's the one day of the year that pastors pick on dads. Reminding us to step up to the plate. To do more. To be more. And I, I got tired of getting beat up on Father's Day. This is the day that we choose to honor fathers. And all my years in church... I never once heard a Mother's Day sermon telling women to step up, to do more, to be more. But every Father's Day, and I understand that as a pastor now, because as a pastor, you don't want to seem self-serving. You, you don't want to look like you're trying to give yourself kudos. But we have chosen as a nation to celebrate this day our fathers. Those men who have stepped into the gap and become leaders. And in the church, godly leaders. I lost my father uh, four years ago this October. Um, some of you know when I was a child, I did not have a close relationship with my father. Our conversations consisted of, how are you doing? 
Good. How was your day? Good. That was about it. When I was 16, my father came to the Lord. And such a remarkable, incredible turnaround. He still had his flaws. He still had a temper. He still would get down sometimes. Sometimes he would pop off. But I could see from the time I was 16 till he passed away three and a half years ago, I could see God working in him. Smoothing out the rough edges. Making him more and more Christ-like. I could see a man that was hardened by life becoming soft. Becoming pliable. Becoming usable by God. When my dad passed away, Father's Day became kind of a hard day for me. Because Father's Day was the one day a year that when I called home, my dad knew I was calling for him. My dad didn't like to talk on the phone. I don't like to talk on the phone. So that made a very unique connection. Well, I, I can't talk to my father on the phone today. I wanted to share some of the men in this church who stepped into that gap for me. Oh, I, I'm Dennis, I'm not trying to embarrass you. But whenever I'm struggling with something, I can pick up the phone and call Dennis. And I can just seek his in advice and his input. God did not leave me alone. Now, I understand because, see, there's another scripture that I want to read to you. This is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you do not have a godly father figure, and then see, sometimes for some people this is a hard day because their dads either weren't there or they were there in a very negative and bad way. But I want to share something with you. Because God says, and I will be a father to you. This, this is our Heavenly Father in Heaven. He is saying, I will be your father. And you will be my sons and daughters. Says the Lord Almighty. El Shaddai. Who sits in heaven and sees every hurt, every success, every joy. He rejoices at your successes. He grieves when you grieve. He stores every one of your tears in a bottle. This is our Heavenly Father. This is the example that we have been given to follow, dads. I want to encourage you today. Keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. We have five biological children, Christy and I. Four of them are married, so God has introduced four more children into our lives. We have eight grandchildren and hoping for more. But throughout the years, God has brought children to us that we call our adoptees. They're kids that, for whatever reason, God has just woven them into our life. And we've had the opportunity to walk with them sometimes for, for a long time. As a matter of fact, uh, this morning I got a, a text from one of my adoptees telling me Happy Father's Day. I'm expecting a call this afternoon from another adoptee. She calls me every Father's Day. Dad, you guys are doing a commendable job in a very, very difficult place. And I want to commend you this morning. God bless you and thank you. We have been working out of Hebrews chapter 6. We've been discussing discipleship. We've talked about the call to be a disciple. We've talked about the demand, the grace, the promise. Now we're talking about what disciples should learn. What is the foundation upon which our faith, our discipleship is built? Now when Scripture says something as plainly as these are the elementary doctrines. These are the basic truths. I think that's a perfect place for us to start. So in Hebrews chapter, I'm actually going to back up to 5 because 
the end of 5 explains the beginning of 6. Okay? Whenever you read a verse that says, therefore, back up and read what therefore is there for. It's not there for no purpose. It's a, 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 an article that allows two thoughts to be strung together. So we have to see the preceding thought to understand where the writer is going. So picking up in verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice, to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, because of what I've just said, therefore, <coughs> let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Okay, so one of the first things you need to understand in this passage is Paul is saying these is not saying these things are unnecessary. Quite the opposite. He's saying these things are foundational. But what he's saying is, okay, you've got your foundation built. Now let's move on to the rest of the house. Let's start looking at some walls. Let's let's look at some roofing, some doors, some windows. Let's continue building this house. So many Christians spend most of their Christ life working on their foundation and never growing beyond that. There's nothing quite so sad as seeing a 50-year-old baby. We have a lot of 50-year-old babies in Christ in the church that have not been pushed that have not been challenged to become more. Couch potatoes exist in the church too, folks. See, God wants more from you than passiveness. He wants you to be active. He wants you to be involved. He wants you to be growing. So the writer is not saying we don't need these. He's saying these should be so fundamental to your faith that, that you do these things without thinking. It's kind of like breathing. I'll share with you. I have a lot of dreams. I dream multiple times a night. A lot of them I can't remember. A lot of them I can remember. I dream about a lot of you. God put you in my dreams and I wake up praying for you. I had a dream. We, Christy and I had laid down to take a nap. When I take a nap during the day, I don't like the light. Christy likes the light. I don't understand it, but okay. So I take a pillow and I put it over my face. Well, somewhere in my nap, I got tangled up in the pillow. And I started having a dream. I dreamed that I was taking a nap and I couldn't breathe. And I was trying to get Christy's attention because I couldn't breathe. And Christy got out of the bed and she went to go do something and Mackenzie was standing in the door in my dream. And she's like, what is wrong with that? And I couldn't express, I can't breathe. And I'm trying to get their attention and Mackenzie's looking at me like, what is your problem? Now, I don't know what was really going on. I know I woke up and I could breathe. I'm not sure, but that when I was napping, Christy wasn't holding the pillow. <laughs> I have no proof either way. So I'll take her at her word. I wasn't doing anything. But when I woke up, it was amazing to me because in my dream, I, I was just desperate for air. See, air is one of those things that we don't think about very often. Unless we're deprived of it. Okay? That, that's something that is fundamental to us as Christians, folks. These things should be so rooted in us that we are quick to see when they're not there. 
Okay? You get into a relationship with another Christian. You attend another church. You should be able to see when these are not there just like you know when oxygen has been deprived of you. That's how fundamental they are. Okay? So last week, we talked about the repentance from dead works. And we talked about there are two words being used for repentance. The first word simply means that, that your mind has changed. You, you've just changed your mind about something. That is not unto salvation necessarily, but it is necessary unto salvation. Do you, do you get the difference in what I'm saying there? Because without your mind being changed about God, without your mind being changed about Christ, you would still be His enemy. You would still work and operate pursuing your own ends. You would still work and operate without an acknowledgement of who God is and the proper relationship between you and Him. So you have to have your mind changed to even want to turn. The, the second word is an actual turning away from. Okay. See, both of these repentances are required. You have to have your mind changed first, and then you've got to turn from where you were going. You've got to be convinced that what God says is true, and you've got to turn and start going where He wants you to go. That's repentance. Okay? I talked with you last week that we can't really take any one of these topics by themselves because God has built this whole thing together brick upon brick. So I can't really talk to you about repentance and not have to address faith. I can't really talk to you about faith without in some measure addressing repentance. I can't deal with either of those topics without dealing with God and with Christ. Okay, So these things are all woven together. They're knit together. So today... We are looking at the second part of this pairing. If you'll notice, when the, the author writes, he chooses three pairings. The first one is repentance from dead works and faith in God. I believe he's using these, these two because they are so intimately connected with each other. Okay, You will never come to repentance without faith in God. Now the word faith is used over 200 times, 216 times. I believe in the New Testament, the Greek word is pistis. Well, I want to start a little bit, kind of back, back up a little bit. What is faith? Well, what is faith? Somebody, anybody? Say that again. Belief in things not seen. You're stealing my scripture. <laughs> I actually want to share with you what Miriam Webster says. One, allegiance to duty or a person, fidelity to one's promise, sincerity of intentions. Two, belief and trust in and loyalty to God. Belief in the traditional doctrines of religion. B, under two, a firm belief in something for which there is no proof clinging to the faith. Three, something that is believed, especially with strong conviction. Do you notice the words that keep popping up? What is the one word that keeps popping up in our definition of faith? Belief. <clears throat> I've got a, another definition. Uh, this, this is a definition that uh, Calvin D. Linton, he's a PhD, he's a teacher of, at a university, uh, in his article uh, on faith, he says, faith is a channel of living trust and communion between morally conscious, free beings. Okay, most of us didn't go to that school. So I'm, I'm going to kind of reword it. This is the Dr. Seuss version. Okay, because I, I read this thing and I go, okay, I've got to break this thing down piece by piece so I can understand what he's saying. 
Okay, a channel of living trust. Meaning that it's, it's fluid, it's growing, it's maturing. It's not a one and done thing. It's ongoing. And communion. Communion. Fellowship. Being together. Togetherness. Between morally conscious, being aware of your morality. Now, this is an interesting concept here. Because apart from the Spirit of God, our morals are kind of wishy-washy, aren't they? They're kind of based on the moment. Where in one moment you'd say, absolutely not, I would never do that. And another moment you'd go, yeah, why wouldn't I? Okay? There's, there's not a lot of concreteness to it. I believe with all of my heart that God has written into the very fabric of each and every human being a moral code. It doesn't take children long to learn to lie because they know if they tell the truth, they're in trouble. You don't have to teach them what is right and what is wrong on a, a fundamental level because when they take the cookie that they were not supposed to take, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I don't know what happened to that cookie. But since we're on the subject, may I have one? I believe that there is a fundamental woven in into our created being a sense of morality. But because of the separation from God, it affects, it doesn't affect us the way it should. It becomes fluid. It, it becomes ethereal. It's not always solid. Say, well, I would never commit murder. If someone came into your house and threatened your child, would your morality change to fit the situation? Well, self-defense is, is different. Well, you've still taken a life. Okay? You, you see where I'm going with this? We're fluid. You know, I would never steal anything. How many pens do you have from work? <laughs> Oops. So morally conscious, conscious, free beings. Free. Free to choose. <coughs> able to say yes, able to say no. Being presented with alternatives, you get to choose. You're not enslaved to one option or the other. This is why I believe with all my heart that God put the tree in the garden. I believe He wanted Adam and Eve to have a choice to choose to serve and love and obey Him. Okay, this is why I, I, I disagree with um, predestination. Although not as much as, as you would think. Because I believe absolutely that it's God that gives us the grace. I believe that God that, that gives us the faith. But I think we have to say yes. I think this is why when God called the nation of Israel to Himself and He brought them into the promised land, Joshua said, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. They were God's people, weren't they? Weren't they all delivered out of Egypt? Weren't they all called His? These are my people. I will make of you a great nation. The great nation that became Israel. They were all His. And yet they are still told, choose. Okay? So, morally conscious, free beings. Now, on the one hand, we have God, who is free to choose. He can, he can accept or deny whatever He wants. The only thing about that, though, is God is always faithful. When God says something, it is so. We, as the other end of this, this line of faith, God being the one in whom we have faith, and, and us being the ones that are exhibiting faith to God, we have the ability to say yes or no. And I've seen far too many people say no. Far too many people. There's another quote I want to read by the, by the same uh, writer. 
Dr. Linton. I want you to, to hear this, okay, because I read this two or three times to make sure I understood this. He says, every dimension of reality, whether material or spiritual, is compatible with faith when that dimension is truly understood. Faith is harmonious with reason, with knowledge, with science, with psychology, with all truth, ancient or modern, though it is dependent on none of them. Okay? See, so I'm going to read it again so you can catch what he's saying here. Okay? Because all too often in our society, in our world, we see faith set in opposition to science, to natural law. Okay? So I'm going to read this again. I want you to, to, to hear this. Every dimension of reality, whether material or spiritual, is compatible with faith when that dimension is truly understood. Faith is harmonious with reason, with knowledge, with science, with psychology, with all truth, ancient or modern, though it is dependent on none of them. I like that last clause there. Though it is dependent on none of them. See, I don't have to be able to figure out the science. Okay? I, I, I've studied a lot regarding creation. Not as much as some people have, but I've studied a lot since I was young. I don't have to know all the answers. As a matter of fact, striving to know all the answers oftentimes gets us in trouble. Oftentimes gets us in trouble. As a matter of fact, I'm working on an ask the pastor question. By the way, it was a brilliant question. Very good. The question is, if Jesus was descended from the line of Judah, why are they tracing his genealogy through Joseph, who was not his biological father? I have an answer for that, and you'll get to hear that next week. Um, but the, 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 the trick about this question is, God did not make clear to us in his word why this was done like this. Because we don't need to know it's not something that God felt, okay, i got to put this in black and white for them. Or red and white, depending who's speaking. <laughs> okay? It's not something that he felt like, okay, you know, they, they, they've got to get this to be able to get the rest of it. And there are things like that throughout all of Scripture. There are things that I read and I go, why did you put that in there? <laughs> that I don't understand why. Okay? <coughs> put it in there, so it's got to be important. So, all things will come in line with faith when properly understood. So we've talked about the word that keeps popping up when we talk about faith. That's belief. Now, interestingly enough, in the Greek, the word for belief is actually a derivative of the word for faith. They, they just added a, a, a little suffix onto the end of it. So instead of being something that is, it becomes something that is active. Okay? And, and the word for faith is used 200, and actually faith is used about 260 times. The word belief is used 216 times. So we see how important faith and belief are and how they, they fit together and they, they move together. You can't have one without the other. Now here's the, the, the caveat. Here's where I want you to be cautious. Just as we talked about with repentance, you can have your mind changed, but that not bring you into a right relationship with God. You can believe and not believe unto salvation. Okay? We can sit down and talk about the archaeology, the historical manuscripts, and I can prove to you, in as much as you can prove anything, that Jesus was an actual person who lived in the area of Judea and Galilee, and, and made a significant impact on historical records. I can prove that to you. But even if you believe that, if that's as far as you go, it doesn't bring you to salvation. Okay? 
Because there's requirement beyond just being convinced that something is so. <clears throat> now, I don't want to diminish the value of knowledge in this, but neither do I want to idolize it. Okay? God has given us what we need to know in His Word. And then goes beyond that with His Holy Spirit that comes in and fills in those gaps for us and gives us things that we could never figure out on, it, on our own. But He did give us knowledge in His Word. And, and we have in this, this kind of mythical thing that the church has become, we've gotten to the point where I've heard people say, well, you don't need to know all that stuff, you just need to have faith. Well, if I don't need to know it, why did God put it in His Word? If God thought it was important enough to put it in His Word, it's important enough for me to know it. Okay? So knowledge is necessary. But neither do I want to glorify knowledge to the diminishment of faith. Because we are never going to know everything. We're just not. Our brains are too small. Our brains are too small. I'm amazed with the way some of our brains work that he trusted us with this much. Okay? Because I still, I get to passages and I, I look at and I go, I, God, I, I, I don't know what you're trying to say here. I don't understand. It's part of why I love to ask the pastor questions because they challenge me. You know? We all have certain beliefs about things that are not dependent on Scripture. They're dependent on other things. How we feel or what we think. And when you guys ask me questions, I've got to get into the Word and I've got to see what the Word says. Okay? Now you've got to understand when I give it back to you, it's coming through the filter of Glenn. Okay? So... <laughs> You know, as a pastor, I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to have all the answers. I don't have all the answers, folks. But I can point you to the one that does. That's my job. Okay? So, we see an example of this in the life of Jesus, actually in the resurrection of Jesus. Because remember when he appeared to the disciples and, and Thomas wasn't there? And then Thomas comes in and, and they're like, well, Jesus was here! And he's like, uh, yeah. I ain't believing it until I put my finger... Talk about gross. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put my finger in his wound. Well, Jesus shows up. Instead of condemning Thomas, instead of coming down on Thomas, much like we do, oh, doubting Thomas, none of the disciples believed. When the women came, none of them believed. All right? They were all doubting apostles. Okay? But when Jesus shows up, does he condemn him? No, he doesn't. He says, Thomas, come here. Put, put your hand in my side. See, see the holes. He allows the fact to build the faith. Okay? So one of the things that we as Christians have to do is we've got to start discovering those facts. Scripture does not say without reason that we should be prepared to give an answer. Okay? One of the, the things that our church is so weak on, I, I don't mean our group here, I mean our church is in the church that universal. One of the things that we are so weak on is apologetics. We are not prepared to defend our faith. Okay? And, and we get into a discussion with people who are prepared with their faith and oftentimes we come out on the short end of the stick. I can't tell you the number of people that I know that grew up in church and have fallen away to different cults. Some of those cults even being atheism and agnosticism. You talk about a lazy faith. I know there's something there, but I don't want to think about it. So faith. We've talked about what man has to say about faith in a couple different ways. But what does God have to say about faith? Well, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. You can't talk about faith without dealing with Hebrews chapter 11, can you? Well, you probably could, but it's going to be missing something. 
So Hebrews chapter 11. This is known as the hall of faith. <clears throat> so here's the definition that God gives us. Of what faith is. Now faith is the assurance. I'm starting in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. God's a genius. God is, is just incredible. Our faith is based on the hope that we have. The hope that God has given us through His Son. That there's a better day coming. That there is something better for us. We don't look to this world. We don't look to this moment. We look to eternity. Where God is taking us. Where He has promised He will take us. These things that we hope for, this is not a random hope like, gosh, I really hope I get a bike for my birthday. This is a certainty that it's something that we are waiting to come to fruition. This is our great hope. God has said it's going to happen. He's proved it through the resurrection of Jesus, the first fruits of the dead. He, he, he put His stamp on it. He put it in His Word. He birthed it in us through His Spirit. We, our hope is not in vain. Okay? But then the second part, the conviction of things not seen. Now think about this for a moment. Scripture tells us that no man can see God except that he die. We are serving a God that defies any type of created production to make him. As a matter of fact, he knew that nobody could even come close to his glory. So, he said, don't even try to make idols of me. You're not going to make it. And yet, that same God created an image for us that we could see. Because Jesus is the very imprint of God. God took a human and went, whop, stamped it with his very self. And that was Jesus Christ. The conviction of things not seen. Have any of you actually seen Jesus? I'm, I'm not asking that in doubt. Because I believe that Jesus has revealed it. I mean, you can't read any of Paul's writings without understanding that Paul saw Jesus after Jesus ascended. It was so significant an encounter that it completely reversed his life 180 degrees. Okay? I, I personally have not. Okay? I remember one time when I was uh, very young in my faith. I was laying in bed praying and I said, God, I, I, I want to see you. I want to manifest yourself to me so I can see you. I cannot begin to describe the fear that came on me. And my, my prayer very quickly became, God, ah, ah, God, I don't want to see you. I did, I'll just go to sleep now. Okay? And, and it was nothing birthed of me because I, in my innocence, I wasn't trying to challenge God. I was new in my faith. I wanted to see. And, and I think God let me feel just a little touch of, of what the, the prophets who, who saw who saw God, I don't believe they saw the Father, I believe they saw the Son, pre-incarnate Christ, and, and every one of them, right on their face. They were overwhelmed. Okay, so I, I believe God let me feel a little bit of that fear. I have never since asked to see Him. You could send Jesus, that'd be okay. But, but uh, I'll tell you, I've never seen the Father. I've never seen Jesus. The conviction of things not seen. Now, <clears throat> why is faith so important to us Christians? Because if we don't have it, we God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Okay, verse 6, just a little bit further down from where we were reading. Without faith, you cannot please God. Okay? Without 
a life-changing, active, charging faith, you cannot please God. I'll go you even further. You cannot be saved. The book of Galatians, uh, Paul deals with the issue of, of the Jews that were trying to blend the law in with grace and, and create this hybrid faith because their understanding out of the Hebrew Bible was God had very specific things that he wanted them to do to be holy. And yet, every year they would have to keep redoing these same things because every year they failed to be holy. And so there was a sacrifice that was required that was greater than the sacrifice of bulls and goats and sheep. And that, that was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. Okay? Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God in, in the New Testament when they, when they quote that phrase, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. They are using that pistuios, that belief, that root word of pistis. They're using that. He believed him, but not just having his mind settled in agreement, but having an agreement with God such that it completely changed his life. Now, we, we think about that passage. Here's, here's uh, Abraham, who has just received the promise of a son, as God had promised him, when, when his wife was well past childbearing age. And, and so this, this boy grows up, and, and he's, we guess, probably about 12 years old, maybe a little bit older because of the, the amount of stuff he had to carry, because they had to carry the wood up. And... and you know, he said, Father, well, I, I see the wood and I see the preparations. I see all these things, but where's the lamb? What does Abraham say? God will provide. And, and we know from the New Testament when, when Abraham laid Isaac on the altar, he was going through with the deed. Why? Because he believed God. He believed that God had said that this child was the child of the promise. Isaac was the fulfillment of the promise that God had given him. So Abraham trusting absolutely in God, I'm going to put this knife down on my son and God is going to raise him from the dead. Because this is the child of the promise that God had said to me through whom will become a great nation. Too numerous to count. I honestly, I, I can't even fathom what that would be like to, to put one of my children down on the altar. I don't know that I have that kind of faith. But I've not been in that situation, so I don't know. Faith is not just a convincing of your mind, it's an altering of your life. Faith should not bring you into just an agreement with God. It should bring you to that place where you realize that you have to be diminished before God unto nothing that he then can raise you up in newness of life. That's the process of salvation. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Without faith, you cannot repent. Okay? If you don't believe that God is an absolute holy God, and you do not believe that you are an absolute unholy person, and you do not believe that God has said, this is the way to be made righteous, you're not going to do it. Now, I'll tell you, we like to quantify our sins. We, we accept some sins, we reject others. And that's problematic, folks. Because, see, we reject this. Oh, man, the church is all over the issue of homosexuality. That is a sin, and, and that is separating you from God. So is overeating. So is gossip. Letting your mouth flap. We want to quantify, and, and we like to measure, we like to put ourselves in comparison, but only with people worse than us. We don't like to hold ourselves up to people that are actually beyond us. And that's not even what we're supposed to do there because who are we supposed to compare ourselves with? Jesus Christ. That's the only one that we measure up against. And, and I tell you, there's not a one of us here that can measure ourselves up against Him in any way. Thank God 
for grace. Amen? Amen. So faith. What is our equation for salvation? Grace plus faith equals salvation unto works. Okay? We've got to keep that order right, folks. You can do no works that are going to impress God unto salvation. The grace He gives you, the faith He gives you, the salvation He gives you. Out of those things, birth the works that He has prepared for you to do in advance. Okay, that's Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. That's, that's our model right there. That's where we, we live in our salvation. We understand we, we were such an insignificant, tiny part of it. All, our, all we did was go, yes, yes. And God did everything, everything else. And even without God, we wouldn't have the ability to say, yes, yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, that you saw our desperate need. Father, that you saw even in our desperate need, our ignorance. Father, we thank you that before you even created, you had determined to make a way. That your, your son, the lamb, was slain from the foundation of the world. And Father, that you have made a way where there was no way, that you spoke into existence those things that were not, and that you have made a way that we can stand before you with the righteousness of Christ. That all of our sin has been taken away, it has been removed from us, we have been redeemed from the curse. I thank you, God, for newness of life. And I ask, Father, this morning that if there is anyone here today that is struggling, Father, you have said you are the answer to every question. I ask, Lord God, that you would give them their answers. Father, that you would be strength to those that are weak, that you would be peace to those that are troubled. <coughs> Father, you would be healing to those who need it, body, soul, or spirit. I ask, Lord God, that you would make of us tools fashioned and fit for your hand. That, Father, you would be able to trust us to do your will. Father, that as we go out into the world, we would be faithful to be your ambassadors. That we would speak light and life and hope. And we would do all of these things in love. We bless you this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.